Are you ready? Are you keeping up? It's a pretty big night. The biggest night of your life, some people would say. But that is a secret, little fetus. A secret between you and me and no one else on this planet. We're going back to a very pivotal night. Back to 2001. I've been here before. It's my life. My memory. But this time, I'm bringing you with me to bear witness to the truth. Are you ready, little fetus? Ready for a lie so perfect, so expert in its craftsmanship, it would ruin everything forever. Dear YouTube, I am here to tell you a secret, a lie more accurately. A lie I told 20 years ago, then just kept on telling. Maybe I've been telling it for longer than you've even been alive. And now it's time to come clean. Because that lie, it bought me the best thing I'd ever had in my life. But then it took it away forever. So let me tell you the story. It's part of a whole collection of stories, actually, but every word is the truth. If you saw the last chapter about my boyfriend, the school shooter, maybe you'll know where this is headed. If not, no worries. I'll leave all the info below, but keep watching. Don't look away. Not unless you don't want to hear about sex, because this chapter, this lie, it has a lot to do with sex. We're going back to a very pivotal night, back to 2001, through the clove smoke and blacklit violet dark of a goth club, the children in smudges of black and white, all trying to look older, more jaded than they really were, wolf sheems playing, the sparrows and the nightingales, the sense of nostalgia, it bleeds even the first time you ever hear it. I've been here before. It's my life. My memory we're walking through. But this time, I'm bringing you with me to bear witness, to consecrate my soul to the truth at last. So this chapter, it's dedicated to Jazz, one of my best friends, dead now, but no doubt hovering near to hear me tell the best gossip the Birmingham scene has heard in a while. <laughs> I call this one my secret, aka do you remember the first time? <laughs> Are you ready? Are you keeping up? It's a pretty big night. The biggest night of your life, some people would say. But that is a secret, little fetus. A secret between you and me and no one else on this planet. Do you understand? Because if you tell him, if you let one single whisper of this land in that beautiful blonde boy on the dance floor's ear, I will literally kill you, okay? I agreed to bring you with me tonight. I lent you my second favourite black rose dress and my second favourite stripy tights. And the price of that outfit is that you go along with my scheme, no matter what you think of it, got it? I know where you come from, that you're from the future, where people are open about all kinds of shit. But look, you are stuck in 2001 now, where the world really is. And trust me, I know how to play this. I know how to play it cool. I'm 16, for fuck's sake. And no one's ever turned me away at the bar. That has to count for something. Like I said, I know how to play it cool. But when you're 16, a high school kid by day, moonlighting as an actual grown-up on the weekends, you have to be able to keep up. 
This is the goth scene, for God's sake. There's no place for youthful displays of exuberance or, worst of all, naivety. I've done everything. That's the vibe. I've done every one. I've been everywhere. Nothing surprises me. That's how you have to come off, okay? That's how you have to play it. Especially right now. Especially tonight. I told you where I'm going after this, right? After the club turns its lights on at 2am, driving the goths like befuddled drunken bats squinting in the brightness out of the club doors and onto the darkened cobbles of John Bright Street. You know where I'm going. Yeah, I told you. I'm staying at Ash's place tonight. In Ash's bed. All night long. I mean, his mum's put me in the guest room next door, officially, but we all know that's not where I'll be. So tonight, I... What the fuck did I just tell you? That word? Verboten. The goddamn V word is not going to apply to me by tomorrow morning, and I don't want to hear it now. It's flat out embarrassing that I didn't lose my virginity before 16, while I was still illegal. Where's the fun in sex at all when the government say you're legal to do it? All the cool kids were 15, 14 even, and I'm 16 and still a... you know what? So help me God, I will kick you in the face if you breathe a single word of that, okay? There's my stepdad. Orange car over there. Get in. He'll take you home. I'll tell you how it goes in the morning. But I am trusting you with this right now, so you'd better know how to keep your great big gob shut, got it? Wait, you're telling me you're going home with Ash and you're gonna f*** him? And you think he won't notice it's your first time? I thought you bled the first time you- Shut up! Oh my god! Uh, I told you, I've got this covered. Fuck. Ash is coming. Piss off and stop giggling. Stop giggling. You're going to ruin everything. It's just him and me now. Once we break away from the herd of goths spilling out of the club. Ash knows everyone. And that means I know everyone now. I've been adopted. I've got friends all of a sudden. We stroll down the hill, me leaning on Ash's arm in my ridiculous eight-inch stripper boots as I sway and totter over the cobbles. We stop at the kebab shop, get an order of big, fat, greasy chips with salt and vinegar. A fight nearly breaks out. It usually does, in there. But we get out with our chips just before the fists start flying. We eat them as we walk through the cold night air down to New Street Car Park that creepy concrete car prison with the blinding fluorescent lights that blink and flicker eerily. It's always so silent in there. The clopping of my heels echoes off the walls, off the ceiling. Like a dodgy underpass, our voices dropping as we hear ourselves echoing through the 2am silence, ears still ringing from the club. It doesn't feel safe, this car park, even with Ash here. It's better once we've stuffed coins into the machine, clambered back into Ash's little green citron. Then we lock the doors, finish off the chips, licking salt crystals and tangy vinegar off our greasy fingers, until off we go, out of the cold fluorescent lighting of the multi-story and into the neon-lit dark of the city centre. I'm not thinking about it all too much, to be honest. My brain's still spinning with the club, with the new songs I liked, with the faces of the goths who I get to, tenuously at least, call my friends. And Ash, I didn't know it back then, but I can guess it well enough now. Ash would have been overthinking everything about tonight. That boy was like a butterfly that just kept on weaving new cocoons to break out of. Just when I think I've pinned him down, I have to reassess the picture. Which version of Ash we're talking about? 
I remember him so clearly, slumped against our couch-sized leather beanbag with a big chilled out grin, blue-green eyes narrowed like a happy cat, mellow as all hell. And sometimes he was like that, but he was also that skinny, neurotic, hair-yanking goth boy who couldn't ever, ever walk around the left side of a lamppost because the right side was the right side and something terrible would happen if you didn't obey that rule. Or the time he read something about wearing matching socks being bad luck and his socks stayed odd for about three years. His breakfast generally consisted of a Prozac pill, a can of Red Bull and a cigarette. <laughs> Have you ever been on Prozac? I wasn't on it yet, but I got on it too eventually and rapidly came to understand his swings between mellow and wired as all hell, but we'll get to that soon enough. Right now, right now we're just driving out of the city towards the bedroom. <laughs> through all the dodgy little ghettos on the east side of Birmingham, then off and away into the leafy countryside, the quiet of the woodlands, until finally we pull up a narrow drive and go bumpity bumping through total blackness, Ash's headlights on full beam, bleaching the trees spooky ghost white, puddles splashing and gravel crunching under the wheels as he spins the car left and the headlights sweep the lawn, then blaze back at us off the grey stone of the garage. He yanks up the handbrake, cuts the engine, and the whole world goes black as outer space. Proper dark, countryside nowhere land dark. No light pollution at all. I plop one huge boot out of the car, then the other, launch back up onto my stilts. You can hear the distant barring of sheep, nothing else, nothing at all beyond a hint of the night wind rustling through the trees. We talk in whispers as he grabs his little clubbing rucksack out of the boot. Then I grab his arm again and we go tottering up the straight bricked pathway across the lawn. It's covered in snails, thousands of them, but it's too dark to see a thing. Almost every step is a gruesome crack and squidge like a broken egg. When we reach the front door, Ash's keys jingle like church bells in the silence of the night. And once we're inside, our whispers drop to barely more than breaths. We both know where I'm meant to be sleeping tonight. If we wake up Ash's mum, it's all over for us. I sit on the rug in the big square porch and Ash helps me undo all 16 buckles on my crazy boots till I'm back on my stocking feet, a hair shorter than Ash again and my toes are having minor orgasms at finally escaping those patent leather torture devices. We creep inside, shushing the meowing of the Burmese cats before we tiptoe up the thick pile beige carpet that covers the stairs, turn left and creep all the way down the creaky hallway till we're safely enclosed in Ash's bedroom. I saw it for the first time earlier, his room. We got ready together, right here. It's gloomy, dark red inside, faded Victorian style wallpaper, not too many fucks given. No one did gothic decor in those days. There's a big monochrome taxi driver poster over the bed, an old white desktop PC to the right and a tiny little fuzzy box of a TV to the left. Compared to my room back home, it's entertainment central. Two windows on either side of the bed and one more behind the TV open out onto trees and trees and more trees. A fresh leafy night breeze always ready and willing to gust away the smells of sex and weed smoke. But I didn't know that yet. All I could see out there was blackness beyond the smudgy ghosts of our own reflections. We crawled onto the bed together. It was the only place to sit, really. 3 a.m., that hour that always feels like it's yours alone, like not another soul outside this room truly exists. We talked for a bit, kissed for a bit. Then Ash broached the subject at last. Sex. <laughs> Was I up for it? Like any time? Yeah, 
I said, like I was surprised it was even a question. Of course. What do you think I'm doing here tonight? He grinned, leaned in to kiss me. But all those greasy chips on top of a stomach full of acidic Red Bull was making me feel sick and bloated and horrible, so reluctantly as hell, I had to add, not tonight though. Not tonight, I feel kind of sick, but definitely, definitely tomorrow. And Ash was happy enough with that. So was I, really. I mean, we've been dancing all night. I felt sweatier and more gross than I wanted to before commencing all those reputed acts wherein you both stuck your faces in each other's crotches and started licking away at body parts that also doubled as piss holes and were alarmingly close to shit holes too. If I'd grown up in the 2020s where asexuality has become a pretty cool thing, it's entirely possible that I never would have bothered trying out sex at all. But back then, not having sex. Ever. That was not an option, especially not on the goth scene. You had to be jaded, cool, experienced, bisexual and kinky. As such, no matter what your actual opinion was on licking somebody else's piss hole, you damn well shelved that away and got on with the job at hand. But even so, surely showering off the club sweat first was a basic courtesy? So, in the end, since we decided we weren't going to do anything tonight anyway, we appeased Ash's mum and I tiptoed off to the big plush bed in the guest room. It was the next afternoon that we finally got on with it. Showered clean, properly fed, this seemed like a much better setup. And Ash's room was such a vibe on a summer's afternoon with the tall green trees fluttering their leaves all around the windows and the golden green light filtering in through the forest and the smell of crushed grass drifting everywhere. The room was bright, lit with this hazy golden softcore porn lighting. It seemed like a kind of peaceful heaven, so unlike the depressing houses facing houses suburban crap my own room looked out on, or even the relentlessly depressing gloom of his bedroom by night. The afternoons were always my favourite times in Ash's room. So, now that it was time and there was no more stalling, we put on some music, both grinning, and got on the bed. I think it was a randomised playlist on his computer, probably illegal Napster downloads, a bit of Wolfsheim, a bit of Ramstein, a lot of Nine Inch Nails. <laughs> I remember the way it always balanced perfectly between hilarious and awkward as all hell when Closer would come on, in the middle of us doing rude stuff. <laughs> I wanna fuck you like an animal. I wanna feel you from the inside. Maybe experienced couples can get it onto that and take themselves seriously, but teenagers? No freaking way. <laughs> Too intense. But once there was music playing, background noise to cover us from parental wrath, well, there was no more delaying this. I remember being pleasantly surprised by how clean he was. How clean he tasted. As soon as I tasted him, which was soon. I wasn't going to give myself away by hesitating, was I? Duh. The minute his pants were off, I was in there. I I think I skipped straight over hands and went directly to mouth, so eager to prove this was absolutely no big thing to me and I was not going to be one of those prude vanilla girls who refused to give head. Nah, no big thing to me, bar the obvious big thing. <laughs> anyway, all that weird stuff about licking things no sane person would surely ever find it desirable to lick, it was fine, actually. Going down on a guy, or going down on Ash, at least. It was just soap-scented skin, nothing more. I 
how amazing was that skin? Boy parts had this texture, man, like rose petals, like the silkiest thing in the whole wide world. It was way better than what we got landed with. And as far as that goes, I'd made absolutely sure there were going to be no giveaways of my naivety today. You know all that shit you learn in sex ed class about hymens and how the first time you do it you bleed? Well, that sure as shit was not going to happen to me. How humiliating. So, like usual, I worked out a game plan. I'd already been using tampons for five years, along with a lot of physical sports like horse riding and gymnastics, so it was honestly pretty likely that my hymen was long busted anyway. Full, slightly gross disclosure, it most likely happened that time, aged 12, on my second ever period, that the only tampons I could get hold of were this awful cheapo brand for a super heavy flow. Big mistake, kids. I used one and the thing ended up swelling up inside me to near enough the size of a fucking beer can, or so it seemed at the time. Ripping that gigantic bastard out of my body was like giving birth and it hurt. So actually, I reckon that was the day the final trace of my hymen got ripped to shreds. How would I know? I was already bleeding, wasn't I? Jeez, girl bodies threw some f***ed up shit at you the minute you turned 11. But regardless of that incident, I was taking no chances on this whole hymen issue. I reckon this has to be a pretty universal experience, right? That as a girl, when you're first told that all the weird pink anemone stuff down there actually has a hole in it, and a pretty damn big one at that, big enough for a baby to come out of. Well, dude, it's a serious bunch of weird. It takes a lot of finding that invisible hole, and once you do, god, it's freaky. You can't see it at all, that entrance, no matter how many mirrors you traumatise. But, oh god, dude, ew. Like, it's hot and slippery and generally just a whole goddamn creep show I wanted nothing to do with. Wanking, masturbation, whatever you want to call it, that shit never did it for me as a teenager. I tried it the odd time, but never found it interesting, titillating, or satisfying. But once I knew I was going to be having sex with the full intention of pulling off the charade of already being sexually experienced, well, I was obligated to work out the basics. So I did just enough exploration to nail down precisely where that weird invisible hole was, and secondly, to make sure that that hole could cope with more than one finger, so I wouldn't seem like a... like a... Like a you-know-what. See? I told you I knew how to play it cool. Nothing was going to show me up. Teenage girls didn't watch porn back then. Not unless they stumbled across their dad's supply of VHS tapes, which, thankfully, I never did. If you wanted to see porn for free online... You'd have to download these short little video clips, and your computer was likely to get stuffed with viruses. As such, I'd literally never seen it. Porn? Not ever. But honestly, I reckon that was a good thing. I'd seen enough movie sex to know how it basically went, and in movie sex, people make pretty realistic noises. If I'd grown up on a diet of hardcore porn, like the poor little brats of the 2020s, I probably would have considered the way to seem experienced a wailing shit show of moaning and groaning and demanding, oh, oh, do you like that, daddy? While I sucked his dick, because that right there, that would have been my lesson in doing sex like an experienced person. <laughs> shit. And if I'd been a boy of the same era, 
I likely would have assumed the normal way to go at it involved choking her, fucking her up the arse with all the delicacy of a goddamn pile driver, then pulling out, grabbing her by the hair and jizzing all over her face. I am so very, very glad my first time didn't go like that, and I sincerely hope yours didn't or doesn't either. We progressed through events and positions in exactly the way I'd expected, more or less. I sucked him off for a bit, then he went down on me, which was actually more uncomfortable than going down on him. I just learned how soft and silky and lovely boy parts were, whereas he had an unenviable face full of that pink anemone nonsense I wanted nothing to do with. But I got on with it, he seemed happy enough. And finally he crawled up the bed. Or maybe I told him to. Come here and f*** me. Has always been my go-to when Oral isn't doing it for me. Or when I just don't understand why they even want to be doing that. So maybe that's what I said. Come up here and f*** me. So on went the condom. I lay back. He got on top of me. I'm pretty sure the first time... It mostly just felt weird, a little painful at points, but nothing serious, just weird, you know? Like pressure and oddness, but quite exciting. Like, dude, this is what it's all about. This is it. I am pulling it off. To be honest, I've never liked anything that much the first time. Not even heroin. It was okay, but I had to learn how to love it and the same went for sex. I guess I blame this on Asperger's. We're creatures of habit. We enjoy the familiar. As a result, first times for us are never mind-blowing. We're too consumed by the strangeness of the unfamiliar. But nonetheless, my mask never slipped. I made the right noises, copied what he did. Kissing, biting, grinding, scratching up his back. And eventually we were done, or he was at least. I doubtless made a passable show of getting there too, which wasn't difficult. There was definitely a lot of interesting stuff going on. And my body seemed to know what to do, even in the arena of faking it. Maybe it's just hardwired into female brains, an essential life skill. I honestly doubt that any girl comes her first time. It's a learned skill, far more complex, seemingly, than getting guys off. So much more varied. What gets one girl off is absolutely not guaranteed to do it for another. But I didn't always fake it with him. Not even in the beginning. Although, to this day, I stand by the principle that encouraging noises are good for everyone. The worst sex I have ever had was with a guy who's was enormous, but who watched me unblinkingly like a creepy sex hawk the entire time. Silent as the grave, motionless but for his thrusting ass. God, that was weird. People get off on porn because they're soaking up the arousal they witness and sex is exactly the same. The more turned on your partner is, the more sexy it feels. And that means a still silent partner is the biggest mood killer of all time. I mean, a clearly faking it partner flinging themselves around like they're mid-exorcism, hollering, memorised porno dirty talk till they're beetroot red in the face. <laughs> Fuck me, fuck me, fuck me, um, is also more hilarious than sexy. But you get what I mean. If there's only two people playing a game, they both have to play it with enthusiasm. Everyone should feel like a winner by the end. And honestly, I'd already won the minute he stuck it in. My virginity was gone forever. That was a thousand cool points in the bag in a single thrust and everything after that, well, it was just a cool new experience. Finally, he rolled off me and we broke apart, laughing. Condom went flying in the general direction of the bin. 
Then I think he smoked one of those cigarettes he was trying to quit, leaning topless out of the window. His left arm bore a tally chart of small, delicate cuts, his punishment to himself every time he smoked one. After that, we talked a bit about sex. Who'd done it with whom before this, before today, before us? He'd had a couple of girlfriends, he said, a boyfriend or two. Over the course of that summer, I came to realise that the girls both sounded like awful users, and at least one boyfriend had been seriously abusive. I never knew quite what it was about Ash that made him such a magnet for that shit. I wish I could have found some way of removing it, that magnet, just ripping it out of his chest and throwing it onto the roof of a moving train, sending so many years of trouble sprinting in the opposite direction, but all that. I didn't know it yet. Neither did he. Anyway, when it came to my turn, my history of sexual relationships, I came prepared. More prepared, perhaps, than I'd ever been for any high school exam. The stupid thing was, Ash knew nothing about my life, knew no one from my high school. I could have made up any wild story about losing my virginity. But I was taking no risks here. This was serious sh- and my alibi had to be watertight, able to stand up to conversations with anyone, anyone at all, in my life. So I'd gone through my entire life history with a fine-tooth comb until I came up with the perfect solution, the perfect story. Are you ready, little fetus? Ready for a lie so perfect so expert in its craftsmanship, it would ruin everything forever. Okay then, this is what I told him. I said I'd lost my virginity the summer before at Glastonbury Festival. My big brother had taken me, but he had a lot of friends there, some he didn't know very well, and all of that was 100% true. A lot of the story was true, actually. See if you can work it out. Pick it apart. On the final night, I said, as we sat around the campfire, I ended up next to this cute, shaven-headed guy I hadn't seen before. And he didn't know that I'd only just turned 15. So he handed me the joint that was going round, and I got stoned for the very first time. I'm pretty sure the weed was laced, too. No weed ever felt like that again. One toke and the whole world just floated away, changed colour. I felt like I could have astral projected into the heavens. Everyone was smoking it. And as the night wore on, we all drifted away, off to our tents, just blanket-wrapped shapes in the smoky, bonfire-lit darkness. Whoops and distant music all around, fires flickering on hillsides as far as the eye could see. This muddy tent city was blazing its last hurrah before the grey grimness of Monday morning and all those sad goodbyes. I ended up slipping into the cute guy's tent with him. It was the farthest away from the group round the bonfire and no one noticed us, or at least no one who knew me anyway knew how young I was. I don't even remember the guy's name, but I think it might have been Joe. Anyway, we went into the tent and I was so high, everything was beautifully weird, like the label of my coat that I knew was white. But I swear to God, it turned green that night and nothing on earth would make it white again till morning. That was the coolest thing that had ever happened to me in my short little life. And in that tent, lit by nothing but a couple of fading glow sticks, we had what Joe, or whatever his name was, thought was just a random Glasto quickie. But was actually my first time. And you never told him? Ash said, astounded when I'd told my tale. Nope, I said, grinning. 
I didn't want him to know. It only make things weird. Who wants to be a virgin anyway? Ash laughed, conceded that point. But I wasn't done yet. If I left it there, if I said that that was the one and only time I'd had sex, well, that wasn't really any better, was it? A glasto fumble that I was too high to really remember, then a year of celibacy until this? No, f no. Ash would be weirded out. He'd treat me like a virgin, like some sad, awkward virgin, and I wasn't having that. So I told him more. I told him about Chris. That was safe enough. They didn't know each other. Chris went to XL's, not Eddie's. And Chris had legitimately stuck his hand up my skirt a lot of times. Close enough, right? So I just embellished a bit. Ash being my third partner was exactly where I wanted him. It took the pressure off, right? He was 20 years old, bisexual, experienced with both men and women, and I was a 16-year-old high school virgin. If he knew that, he'd never look at me the same again. He might feel all sorts of wrong about today. And besides, I'd already decided on this course of action before I even climbed into bed with him. I sure as shit wasn't changing tack now. And the thing is, these lies were all wreathed from the dried roses of nearby truths. Shaven-headed Joe, or whatever his name was, did actually exist. He had, just as I said, passed me a joint laced with God knows what on the final night of Glastonbury. The only one of my brother's friends who didn't know that I was the kid's sister and that all the drugs were supposed to go over my head. A stance that had pissed me off all goddamn weekend. And that laced weed? It got me fucked to high heaven. It was a beautiful, unique, amazing fucking night. So why not use that first time as source material for a different first time? To me, drugs were always more exciting than sex anyway, so really, it wasn't untrue, was it? That night was my first time. And Chris? Fuck him. He was a cheap-ass user who only tolerated me for the drinks I bought him and the underage pussy I let him grope. He fucking well owed me some cool points. And that, that's the truth. All of it. But you know who else knows this truth, little fetus? Why do you think I called it a secret? Nobody else knows. Whoever clicks on this video first, congratulations. You're the first person in my entire life to know the truth about how I lost it. Because that story, I stuck to it. Not just with Ash, but with everyone. Right up to the present day. Two decades later. I didn't mean to lie for 20 straight years. I didn't plan that far ahead. It's just that Ash knew everyone. Like I said, everyone knew Ash. So if I told them the truth, my next boyfriend or my next, if I told them that Ash was really my first, but that he didn't know it, well, someday if we split up and they hated me, they could have really, really fucked me over by telling Ash what a liar I was. So I kept my secret. I kept it forever. I kept it too long. I already told you everything, didn't I? Remember how I showed you that torn up, tattered, faded piece of cardboard? Call me if you like. No problem if you don't. Ash. His introduction to me. Do you remember? The piece of trash with the beating heart. The piece of the past that I never let go of. Not in twenty long years. And I told you more than that. 
I told you how I always meant to show it to him someday, to show him that I'd kept it all this time, because that's how much he meant to me. And when I showed him that, well, I was going to tell him a secret too. This one. This great big juicy secret. Ash, you were my first. <laughs> and I know why that'll mean so much to you. Because the thing is, you lied too that day, didn't you? You'd gone down on girls and you'd been with guys but you'd never not ever gone all the way with a girl not before me I was your first too do you know how I know that it was just some random day so many years later we'd been into the city we were on the train home and somehow for some reason we got talking about sex about first times you already knew mine or so you thought. So the conversation turned to yours. Who it was, your person number one. And you, Ash, well, like I said, you always were a terrible liar. You went all quiet, and when I pushed it, you glanced around at the train, at all the other passengers, then back to me with a wry little smile, and you said, I'll tell you later. It was written all over your face. Why do you think I grinned too? You just made it all the more special, my big reveal. I knew that when I told you everything someday, like, look, this is how important to me you are. Look at this ridiculous piece of paper I kept for all these years just because it was the first thing you ever gave me. And you know what else, Ash? You were my first. Not just love, you already knew that, but sex, too. First ever. I kind of lied that day. Because I didn't want to seem like a naive kid to you. But it was you. It was you all along. And I figured it out eventually. I was your first, too. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Everything we've shared... And now this too. I'm sorry I didn't tell you sooner. I just wanted to wait for the right time. So now you know. <laughs> we both lied that day. But it was just as special for both of us in our heads, in secret. No more lies now. You know everything, all of it. What do you think, Ash? We could get back in bed. We could role play that first day all over again do it all over but as if we hadn't lied you like acting me too let's do it again our first time take two and that that was what I should have said what I wish like hell I just fucking said I even know the right time now, the right moment. Ash and I, we were never done with each other, not really, and finally we got back together again. There was an exact right moment. We were both high on methadrone, this ecstasy-like empathogen, that night, just the two of us. Talking bollocks, talking truth, and Ash, he asked why we hadn't had sex in a bit. That was the moment. The moment I should have told him everything. Everything I felt for him. How much he really mattered. But instead I shied away. Clammed up. And what came out was... I think I just prefer us as friends. I thought I'd get to keep him, you see. My Ash. My best friend. I'm grey sexual. The attraction wasn't always there. But we could have worked on it. We could have worked through it if he just knew the truth that we weren't only back together as fuck buddies. That stupid, insecure lie we mutually engaged in all summer. I was in love with you, Ash. You stupid, stupid fuck. 
<laughs> and I know you felt the same. But I wasn't diagnosed yet with Asperger's and I still trailed four years of maturity behind you. I couldn't communicate it, nor any of it. And you, you didn't see. Why didn't you see? Why couldn't you have been psychic just for that one moment? I still hate you for it. And I hate myself even more. <laughs> because I didn't know how much was at stake that night. I didn't know that second chances can be final chances. Because Ash started dating someone else. This isn't going where you think. Like, uh, he moved on and I didn't. Huh. It was way, way worse than that. She was this German girl called Nia, who we met on holiday. Within two weeks of getting back home, she convinced him to let her fuck emigrate, literally move continents and into his place. They hadn't even known each other a month. Kids, always, always beware the fast-moving relationship. But no one told me that, did they? I was only 23. I'd never even met Nia. I actually, I actually fucking encouraged him. I only wanted him to be happy. And Ash, like I said, he had this magnet for disaster stuck deep, deep in his chest. On top of that, just like me, he'd always rather lie than look weak. Because Nia, she turned out to be violent, jealous, controlling, an abuser in the extreme. But how could he get away when she'd moved into his literal house and she knew no one else in the entire country? Sending her packing was impossible. And what man wants to admit he's being bullied, abused by a woman? So Ash existed, silently trapped in her web of terror for eight long years before he dared speak to anyone about any of it. Nia had long since banned me from his life, but I was still the first person he came to when he needed to escape. We talked for hours. I thought I'd got him back. I really, really did. Nearly a decade had passed. I still hoped that we could both be happy. As friends, as whatever, really. But the damage was done. Ash was someone else by then. After everything that had been done to him. His identity as the beaten, cowed victim was so set in stone. It took less than a month before he found someone else. Another fucked up, manipulative bitch to give him his fix of scary intensity. The no-holds-barred love followed by a whirlwind of tears and blame and drama. A woman to control every inch of his life and banish every true friend from his world until she had him gripped on a choke chain every bit as tight as Nia's. Ash had been in a prison cell for almost a decade, barely daring to breathe, a victim in his own home. He'd utterly forgotten how to live his own life, experience freedom, be his own man. He couldn't live without the abuse. And the second one? She was good. She was far, far smarter than Nia. Any time Ash was with friends, she'd be twined around him like a cobra, literally jerking him off under the table, twisting his face to look into her eyes until no one else could speak a word to him. Every day on Facebook, she'd be harping on about finding her soulmate and how could a boy, a man now, as damaged as Ash, resist that? If he ever left her side, she freaked out, drank herself silly, got self-destructive, paranoid about what he was doing out there. So Ash couldn't go anywhere. Not without her. Not without that woman wrapped around him like an insecure, sex-starved serpent. Until it became impossible for Ash to have friends at all. You couldn't talk to Ash. Not anymore. 
because his limpet third testicle would be right there every second fielding his calls, answering his texts, plonking herself between you both, her hands sliding up his thigh to grip him by the dick, in case for a single second he tried to concentrate on a conversation that wasn't controlled by her. Like I said, she was so, so much smarter than Nia. The second one, the limpet, she claimed to have been abused too, and there you have it. Her get-out-of-jail-free card for any crazy behaviour. Her perfect reverse psychology. Ash would bend over backwards to seem different from her abuser. Softer, weaker, more submissive. She liked to say they were both rescue kittens, finally happy together. I mean happy together so long as he did exactly what she said. So she didn't have to drink an entire bottle of Jack Daniels, scream at him till she had an asthma attack, then <gasps> flinch <gasps> dramatically <gasps> the second he argued back or disagreed at all until he found himself on his knees apologising for scaring her for being the abuser. That woman was a doctorate level gaslighter and even better at acting, always ready to scare him straight with her drunken, wheezing, fainting spells. The drama was non-stop now, and Ash... <laughs> Ash was exhausted. She'd made sure of that. Brainwashing 101. She persuaded him to do a full-time degree at the same time as working a full-time job to better his situation. Even though the Ash I knew already had his dream job, with summer holidays that let him travel the world, taking photos, everything he loved most. But she was in his ear 24-7, and in the end, he spent the next three years getting five hours sleep a night at most, practically falling asleep at the wheel, then unwinding with half a bottle of Jack every night so that she didn't feel so bad about drinking and drinking and drinking and drinking alone. Perpetually hungover, eternally sleep-deprived, and cut off from every friend he ever had, Ash didn't stand a chance. Who the fuck was going to get him to a therapist specialising in male abuse victims when his abuser answered his every call, his every text, and wouldn't let him leave the house without her. The Ash I knew, he was long gone. The new Ash, that overworked, overabused, hollowed out shell of a man. Guess what? He married the second one. Doesn't even end there. She controlled the guest list, not just for the wedding, but also for his stag do. I was barred, naturally, along with anyone else who knew the old Ash just a little too well to not see the truth. Even so, she sent her maid of honour slash little spy puppet to attend Ash's stag do just to make 100% certain Nobody got an honest word in his ear during those pivotal three hours apart. It was crystal clear by now that the boy I once knew was as dead as the final dodo. Why do you think I called him Ash in this project? It's not his real name. It just fits. So I never saw him again, Ash. Not the shell. And definitely not that beautiful blonde boy from the club. The one that existed before all the soul got beaten out of him. But I'll never stop hoping, just a little, that someday that boy will realise what he tolerates isn't love, isn't right. And maybe, maybe I'll get my best friend back. Battered and bruised, but still in there somewhere. I dream about him, even now. Never sexually. He's just my friend. My Ash. Lying to him that day about my virginity, it was the right thing to do, I think. It made us both more comfortable. 
but there comes a time to tell all juicy secrets. And there's no excuse when it comes to the ones that would light up the person you love. But instead, I locked his heart-shaped box, tossed away the key. It sank to the bottom of the deepest ocean, that box. It rusted clean away until the secret just floated loose. So here it is, adrift on the ocean currents, free and eager for anyone to pick up and read. So now you know, little fetus, the one thing about me that Ash never knew. He was my first. And just like Frank Sinatra said, you can't take that away from me. And she can't take that away from him either. So that's the end of that chapter. And now you know my secret that, yep, for 20 years I lied to every single one of my sexual partners, every single one of my friends about how I lost my virginity and who to. Um, sometimes you tell a lie to one person and then it kind of becomes um, impossible to ever tell the truth to anyone else because, like, say, the one person I came closest to telling the truth to, who actually guessed the truth, one of my other partners, who will come up later in this project, the second and only other guy I've ever been in love with, he guessed about me and Ash. He guessed everything. He guessed that we were each other's first love and sex, and he guessed that we would get back together, which we did after him. But anyway, I, I told him, no, no, he wasn't my first sex. No, you're wrong about that. Because I knew if this ends badly and he's pissed and he knows that he can get back at me by telling Ash this secret, I'm not risking that. And it's a goddamn good thing I did because that guy who I nearly told who guessed the truth, oh, he was a manipulative little tosser. And I reckon he would have done that if I had have told him yeah, Ash was actually my first and he doesn't know, so never tell him. Oh, he so would have dumped me in it when we broke up. He so would have. So sometimes it's right to lie. It was right to lie at the time, I think. And like say, Ash lied too. <laughs> we both lied. And um, that was the culture of the goth scene. It really was. It was so like, you can't be naive. You can't be a virgin. You've, you've got to be into these things to the point that both of us lied. And, um, and it's so ridiculous. But that night, 2008, on Methadrone, when we were just talking and talking and talking about everything, I don't know what it is with me, but I have always been too sober on drugs. People have commented so many times when back when I used to do a lot of drugs people would comment all the time like you've done as much as me you've done more than me how are you so sober and um I don't know maybe it's my wacky brain chemistry with Asperger's and stuff but I always was the most sober person in the room like I'd be high I'd be having my own experience but somehow there would always be this bit of me that would stay sober enough to just not be on the same plane as everyone else and it really f***ed me that night. It really did. You know, Ash was spilling his guts about everything. I mean, he, he talked for hours about Slash's biography like the guy was his best friend. It was the cutest, most naive, funny, sweet thing you'd ever seen. He would have listened and we would have reached an understanding. And if there is any point in my fucking personal history I could rewind time to and just do it all over again, it is that moment in 2008 when I just said... We should just be friends. Maybe not even that moment. Maybe any of the moments before that, that we were, you know, that whole summer. Oh, yeah, we're just fuck buddies. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Ash didn't do fuck buddies. He didn't. That wasn't what he was like. And when we first got back together, I wanted to be with him, not... Yeah, I loved his soul more than anything sexual really you know typical gray sexual shit, really but we could have worked around it easily um we could have done and we never did and that ended regretfully for both of us i don't know 
what's going on with him these days. I haven't spoken to him in several years. Um, like I said before, he turns 40 this year. Is it going to make him kind of reassess and look at his life and realise what he's going through and what he's stuck in isn't right and isn't how it ought to be and that he could do so much better. I mean, it took him eight years, eight years with Nia um, before he realised this isn't right, this isn't love, this isn't abuse, but you know what? He only got out of that with Nia because he fell in love with someone else. He had to have something to latch on to. He was addicted to love. He always knew he had an addictive personality and he was very good with that when it came to drugs. He got out of drugs before it went very wrong because he knew, I like this too much. I'm, I've got to stop. But he never saw it when it came to love. Like, when it came to love, his addictive personality consumed him and led him to so many abusers. You know, he'd been with abusers before we met. Our relationship was codependent for sure, but never abusive. Um, but when you're an absolute sucker for love and you will bend over backwards for the person you're with and you, you're you happy to be with that person 24-7, you are ripe for abuse. Absolutely ripe for abuse. Um, and... I kept telling him after Nia, I kept saying, look, you need to learn to stand on your own two feet for a while. You need to learn to be single for a while. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -mm -mm -mm. No, no, all words, no action. And second one, who we're not even giving a name. I'm not even going to bestow her with a fake name. I could call her Karen, but uh, I don't agree with this whole, like, turning a random woman's name into like this Karen I, I don't agree with that there's plenty of cool people in the world called Karen who shouldn't have their name sat on so no I'm not I'm not I'm not giving any name to this bitch she's just the second one <laughs> and um I I hope eventually she's uh the divorced one <laughs> whether or not I ever see Ash again I truly hope he ends up with someone better than that woman but um anyway if you ever see this ash and you recognize yourself in it because obviously that's not your real name but um if you ever see this then now you know if you ever if you ever want to get free of whatever situation you're in um i never change my number my number stays the same you've still got it and uh you can call me anytime, and I've thought about calling you a lot of times, and I never have. Because I know she would pick up the phone, <laughs> just like she always did. Um, for the whole time you were together, it was impossible to get through to you. It was impossible. She fielded everything. She made you lie about things, and I could tell because you're the worst liar in the world, but nevertheless the phone's lines are always open always always for you always yeah the next chapter i'm still writing but it's going to be back in the fun place just because we had to jump ahead to the future to make you understand all of this we're we're still staying in 2001 we're still having a nice time there and um there's still a lot more tale to tell so uh yeah, if you want to know more about this project and see the other chapters and all of that, I will leave all the details and shit below. Hope you enjoyed this chapter and it didn't bum you out too hard. And uh, if you're in an abusive relationship, I really hope you seek help. Um, and if you're male in an abusive relationship, or you're male in a relationship that just doesn't feel right, that just leaves you feeling weird a lot of the time, or the is cutting you off from the people in your life. She's making a lot of decisions for you. She's pretending to be super helpful, like, oh, just let me help you with this. Let me answer your phone for you so, I, so you can keep working. Let me do this, blah, 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 blah. And suddenly your friends are drifting away and there's something not right there. There's something not right and it will get worse and worse. It will. Um, whoever you are, you need to be read up, educated and aware about abusive relationships because they can happen to anyone and I don't want to see anyone else's life go the way Ashes did 
Um, so anyway, I will leave it there and I promise you the next chapter will be more cheerful. So uh, as I say on the end of all of these, I do have a book out. If you would like to see more of my writing, it is called The Putrescent Vein. You can just search it up on Amazon. It comes in Kindle or book version and you can read that right now. Whereas this writing project is going to be a book eventually, but it ain't there yet. I'm literally reading you bits as I write, which is so fun. But um. <laughs> means I can't I can't throw the book at you at the same time so the putrescent vein is the book for now if you want to read some writing um and I'm going to shut up and go and do something more cheerful now I knew this chapter would bum me out I knew it would but uh anyway yeah it's kind of good to have my secret told so anyway over and out see you soon bye <laughs> mm -hmm.